Okay. Okay. So welcome to the post lunch session of the last day of this uh, conference. Uh, so now our next speaker is uh, Dr. Devendra Tiwari, who is a postdoc at uh, Vaskara Jajapatishtana, and he will be speaking about modular group and drawings. Devendra. Okay. Thank you, Prasendu, and thank you, Professor Katri, for giving me opportunity to talk in this event on Professor Kulkarni's 80th birthday. I will be talking on the modular groups and drawings, which I have been recently discussing with Professor Kulkarni, and I will kind of survey some of the work on this topic by Professor Kulkarni. So here is the plan of the talk. After introducing the modular group, I will uh, explain the, what is the topological aspect of this in the study of modular group and corresponding quotient, which is known as modular curve. And there is a special theorem by Millington on the finite index subgroups of the modular group, which Professor Kulkarni has. We are unable to hear. Yes. Not able to hear? Ah. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Okay, so Professor Kulkarni proved this using certain geometric method, which was proved initially by Millington using the permutation representations. And in this work of Millington, he has conjectured some final classification of the subgroups of the finite index, which we are studying using the methods of Professor Kulkarni right now. And in the after that, this is the one part of the talk. After that, in the second part, I will talk to the another work of Professor Kulkarni using the, the various symbols and constructing fundamental domains of the congruence of the rather finite index subgroups of the modular group. Uh, so, before begin with, I would like to congratulate Professor Kulkarni for the thousand full moons. And recently, I come across this. So I consider Professor Kulkarni qualified this thing to be considered always young, rather younger than the younger students of mathematics. So modular group is a group of Mobius transformation with the integer coefficients as determinant one which is basically generated by these two elements, which are of order two and three. And combining these elements, we get an order element of order infinite. And their lift in the covering group SL2Z is the, these following matrices. Uh, we study this group basically by many methods, but in the Geometry, it is mainly studied by acting it on the upper half plane. And the kind of quotient that we get are often known as the modular curves. It is defined here, modular curves are the branch Riemann surfaces arising as a quotient of the upper half plane by subgroups of finite index in the modular group. Here is a particular fundamental domain of the modular group under this section. And it's translate, we will give a picture of it next slide. And translate of it, isolate the upper half plane. So here is the picture. So, <clears throat> and there is a, another half part of this D is we denote by D star, uh, which is missing from the picture. It, uh, it is central line going from the top would make the D star. And it is by identifying the edges of G star, we get a quotient surface, which we call modular curves. Modular curve and fundamental, this fundamental domain are the very well studied objects. And we geometrically represent it like this way. Identifying two copies of the D star and sewing them along the edges. 
now there is a famous isomorphism between TSL2Z and the two free product jet three, which arises because of the two elements we discussed in the first slide of order two and three. And there is a very brief proof by this theorem isomorphism by Rosel Alpin in an article of just one page, which uses this fact about the free product of subgroup in any, any general group. So this says that G is a free product of its subgroup A and B denoted by G is equal to A star B if and only if it is generated by this subgroup and if W is some word by AI elements in the subgroup A and BJ elements in the subgroup B and AI BJ are different from the identity except possibly for one condition then W is not the identity element of G. So he basically, Alpin uses this argument, this fact to get the proof of the PSL2Z isomorphic to jet cross jet 3 by acting this group on the set of A decimals. Now let us assume that phi be a finite index subgroup of index T in gamma. Gamma is our notation for the modular group PSL2Z in the most of the talk. Then by the closed subgroup theorem, it is abstractly isomorphic to a free group of free product of E2 copies of Z2 and E3 copies of Z3 and R copies of Z. The geometric invariance of phi includes the G, which is known as genus of the group, and respectability, which is known as the number of cusp of the group. We identify on the corresponding modular curve. And E2 is the number of elliptic branch point, and E3 is the number of elliptic branch point of branching index, respectively, two and three. G, T, and R are related by this relation. R, we can consider something like as a rank of the group. E2, E3, R, and D are the intrinsic invariants of the phi as a subgroup of finite index. And the tuple, the long tuple we have mentioned here, D is index, R is the rank, G is the genus, T is the number of cusp. E2 and E3 are the elliptic branch point or branching index two and three. And D1, D2, DT are the different cusp of different cusp widths. T number of cusp of different cusp width. And with this tuple, we will mean the long signature of the subgroup gamma. It will help in the final study of the gamma, uh, subgroup phi of gamma. And by a small tuple T, R, E, 2, E, 3, we will represent the short signature of phi. This signature are the invariant of the topological action of gamma on H2. And here is the notation we will use for the corresponding quotient by any finite index subgroup phi of gamma. And X gamma would be a corresponding quotient of by the gamma itself, both with the cusp. cusp Cusp cutoff, which we will make it clear what does it mean soon. Now, the topological study of this theory of this study is basically related to the covering interpretation of the Kuros theorem only by Professor Kulkarni in his work in 1983. To understand what it means, we can consider gamma as a Z2 as a three product Z3 and think of the corresponding quotient with cusp cutoff is made up of the topological spaces which have the fundamental group Z2 and Z3. For example, we can take P as a some projective plane and L as a some length space which have a fundamental group Z3. With, we will denote this P and L by certain diagrammatic representatives and try to construct the connected covering corresponding to the any finite index subgroup using the Gross theorem and Roman Hurwitz formula to construct the coverings for a given sub subgroup of a given signature. 
So this is the cusp of cutoff. So we have seen the modular cut before it, where the stop point goes to the infinity and after some length we can try to cut it off. Then it does not if, uh, affect it topologically, both objects are same. So this object is again, we can try to by some topological manipulation, we can make it like it, this second object with two specific point of order two and three. And again, by some again topological manipulation, this would be like a dumbbell here. And so finally, we will consider can consider as the two balls attached by an edge and two specified point two and three. So this would be our ultimate picture of a modular curve to construct the coverings. For the topological consideration, we will consider the wall island characteristic of a group which was studied by CTC wall in its works on the group cohomology and island characteristics of groups. And with his definition, the modular group gamma has this characteristic minus one by six. And for any finite index subgroup with a signature E2, E3 and R, uh, we have this formula for the characteristic of a finite index subgroup phi. This is basically the genus formula. Psi of, uh, chi of phi is equal to d times chi of gamma, which is essentially gives the Riemann Hurwitz formula in our case. So these are the very important tools in this study and constructing the coverings. Every time you have a given a signature, so you will have to compute the index of the group and then you start the construction of the coverings. So Millingston has the following theorem. In two forms, we will present it here. So given a signature, E2, E3, R and D, which we call the SART signature, satisfying the Riemann Hurwitz formula above. There exists a subgroup gamma for a finite index having these invariants. A strong form of this includes the finer information about the geometric invariants like genus G and number of cusps or even number of cusp widths also, but we will consider that part later. So given integer E2 greater than zero, D3 greater than zero, G positive and T positive and D positive satisfying the Riemann Hurwitz formula on the previous slide, where R is related to G and D in this way, there exists a subgroup of finite index realizing these invariants of corresponding modular curve like quotient surface. So here is a remark. Why these uh, groups do not arise? Because they are, do not satisfy the riemann hurwitz formula. So Millingston's original method was consist of the relating the existence of subgroup of D with the existence of certain permutation in the symmetric group and finding these permutations electrically, which was quite mm -hmm. a epic proof around 1970. And here's one remark that conjugate subgroups have the same signature and the same cusp split, cusp which we will define after some time. But for except converse is not true. Rather, for even the t is equal to one case, when there is only one cusp with the number of, uh, as the d increases, like index increases, the number of classes for classes, you see classes for a given group tends to increase very rapidly. 
the method we present here is by construct instead of constructing permutation we will construct diagrams the kind from the kind of diagram we above considered and we will call combinatorial complex to this diagram or group complex for a given subgroup phi with given signature so like here is an example of construction a general model for the c phi group complex uh, maybe you can recall something how we will consider our original it is a kind of cover of the original modular cover curve here two three so from this you can infer how we are trying to construct it we will tell some details about how the construction works and some examples also so here is a particular case of the finite index subgroup of index seven so we can pause here and try to look at this figure somehow so we will describe what is what are these blocks we have some names for this so three plus three plus one block makes it seven similarly two 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 and one two makes it seven so these are the you can intuitively say that how the these two sides are related with seven but we will make it precise a little bit in some time here is another example of index six subgroup So how we will build these complexes? We are building blocks are the, we will kind of break out the original modular curve, which has two and three. And left side, we will keep it, it is a block with the left hand edge. We call it two block of type one, has one left edge. And similarly, the right side part of the modular curve with has right edge and number three specific point it is called because on our original modular curve there were two specific points so in the geometric consideration or more when we consider more structure in arithmetic or other purposes these points uh, have vital importance but topologically they are just simply points so we are considering them as a point so three block of type one has one right edge similarly now to understand this part, we will make it as a statement, but why these different blocks arise, one has to understand that we will consider this first block as the most fundamental group is Z2. And the second block has a fundamental group of Z3. Now the blocks described in the sec third and fourth can be considered as the corresponding covers under the restrictions of the what is basic covering space theory so devendra huh. so uh, how do you know that uh, this complex I, I don't see i mean your slide properly i mean yeah. there is this box over the slide uh, which okay. is coming out. so this no. this complex c5 mm. ah, Hmm. Uh, I mean, why it is made up only these four building blocks and no others? Uh, because of this uh, constraint we have put now. So our original modular curve here, this slide you see and read properly. So we will build the covers with those objects. Oh, which and, fundamental groups? Z2 and Z3. Huh. Okay. So being Z2 and there are only two possibility of being subgroup of Z2 and only two possibility of being subgroup of Z3. So that's why those blocks in the uh, article three and four here. Yeah, yeah. So, so, this, so these blocks means uh, kind of? Uh, covers of these original blocks, A, original. first and two. Like two has itself as a covering and this third item okay. as a covering. Similarly, mm -hmm. uh, block in the three has itself as a covering and the block in the item four as a covering. So here we are just describing that I just described to Krishnendu. 
Okay, okay, go ahead. And yeah, so there would be certain concern of thickening these diagrams after constructing them. The uh, diagrams I have shown before, they are not the thickened diagram. And uh, originally after thickening, they correspond to the original surface. Like we pinched it, the original modular cover to a linear diagram. Similarly, after constructing the linear covering, you can say, you have to thicken it to make it the original surface diagram. So those, those surface diagram would be uh, homeomorphic to the branch covering of the modular curves. Similarly, the blocks we considered in the previous slide, we have this thickening of them like this way. So since we have a linear objects, we can easily embed them in R2 and we start trying to glue them and there would be no such topological concern. So we can consider as it is quite clear from the picture that those blocks can be considered as a closed disk with the appropriate number of arms. Now after the final covering that completes, if you see the diagram that we have considered, the connecting edges should match to the number of the index, year six, year seven. So this is kind of constraints coming from the Riemann Horwitz formula. Now the final construction with cut off is obtained by gluing each left arm with one and only right arm in a certain way so that we get a connected complex. We call this complex the combinatorial complex of phi or group complex of given subgroup phi. So after thickening the X phi we, and considering the canonical projection, oh, sorry, here is the typo, the right hand X phi is X gamma actually, giving the branch covering of the surfaces. So this object actually X gamma. So essentially there are lengthy processes of constructing, especially when they have a long signature, you have to consider it a lot of things, but essentially you have to exhaust the number of edges from the both left side object and right side object and ultimately get a connected picture. No block from the consideration of the Riemann Hurwitz formula, we will uh, get a number of three block of uh, three type and block of two type and those all blocks should be joined in the final picture. So we have a connected picture. So this makes the covering construction complete. And by the basic uh, covering space theory, they are correspond to the conjugacy classes of the subgroups and conversely. Now, this was the Millington's work using the permutation methods and other things. Uh, but there's some finer information one can gain if we consider the, what is called cusp split. Let me show the picture first and then come to the definition. So here is the covering. Here is the cusp of the base surface. When it lifts to the cover, it, it splits like D1, D2, Dt. And they have a different, they could have a different cusp width. They can have the same cusp width. And they all sum up to the D. So this is the called the cusp width. And this was not, uh, Millington was not able to solve this problem to construct the finite index subgroup with a given specified cusp split in terms of the cusp width. So let us see what are the definitions first. So the degree of the covering of a particular boundary component is classically called cusp width. And cusp width of a finite index subgroup is the partition of the index T into the T number of inequivalent cusps 
they could be equal also but in general case they would be in equivalent dt is equal to d1 plus d2 plus dt so that for the convenience we will consider them in increasing order cusp is the geometric invariant and cusp of the all cusps is the total degree of the covering So Billington studied and proved the existence of a subgroup of a given type, but could not prove the existence of a subgroup with a given cusp plate. And she even also observed that uh, not every cusp plate is realizable. We will present her table actually. So this means that uh, there exists solutions of the Riemann-Hurwitz relations such that some partitions of D into T parts, there is no corresponding subgroups. So with this study, Millington left a question that the existence of a integer n such that for any allowable group type D with D greater than n and any partition of D into T parts, they exist a group of this type and with this cusp split. Basically, it means that if uh, index is large enough, then one can construct every uh, one can construct subgroup of a given partition of any of D. And so this problem was again studied using permutation and coset diagram by Stothers. And he provides certain conditions which are very difficult and time consuming to state here, but they are not very clean according to him. And we will study this our method of the constructing the group complex and uh, as we presented before this problem again. So here is the Millington's table for the small index subgroups. So for example, here she puts the invariants. First is the cusp are only two. So there is only two partitions, D is equal to D1 and D2. We see start with uh, index three. And these numbers that appear a little bit random, they're all because of the Riemann Hurwitz condition, which put restrictions on the different combinations of these invariants. And as you can see, when the number of tests is low, and index is small, then a lot of things are not possible to realize. Like these tests are the impossible subgroups. No, no, sorry, not dash. The numbers which are written here, we, they are the impossible partitions. So if one has a kind of making surface diagram like with Handel and genus and Cus, what I understand is that when the index increases, we get more rooms to construct the diagrams. As we noted that if there are for a conjugacy classes of subgroups increases rapidly with the given index. So when the number of subgroups, so there are various possibilities of constructing groups and realizing different partitions. This was the, our, my personal experience of constructing diagrams. So here is one diagram to compute the cusp width. We will show some diagram more and compute the cusp width actually. But this is the general picture. Here is a particular picture of some diagram and index. So we are considering index 12 subgroup and there are two different cusp splits. The cusp split like inner boundary. So here are only two cusps. One is the inner boundary and one is the outer boundary.
this is I think wrong picture, wrong information. You know, you can just try to or maybe not. No, it is not because here we have some genus also. So there is only two components. One has the cusp split two, and one has the cusp split ten. Here we do not have any genus, so it is easy to count the things. So middle part has the cusp with four, and this region has the cusp with two, and the, this region has cusp with two, and the outer boundary has the cusp with four again. So here again, some genus case and some non-genus case. It is often difficult to recognize the genus also. So these are the difficulties basically. When genus is zero, it is very difficult to handle this problem, and we have been we have been able to handle it for the t is equal to two case. So here the two cusps of very small one and one, and then there is a two, and then the rest of the outer boundary has the cusp width eight. So these you can consider as a thickened diagrams. So what we present I present next is not a thickened diagram, it is a linear diagram. So and here is some case of the torsion free genus zero case, where it is very easy to draw pictures and compute things. So the semi-cycloidal case, when the t is equal to two, there are only two cusps. We have the following results and following claim. So R we have considered two g plus t minus one, and if we consider genus is equal to zero, then and t is equal to two, then R immediately becomes one. In this case, we realize that we we are able to construct the diagrams. And only those partitions are missing, which was studied by Millington also. For the arbitrary case R, when the, we consider the genus also, then the construction become a little difficult, but we still have a very good calculations and idea, I think, to write down a proof for this thing also. For arbitrary are given a semicycloidal subgroup five with long signature. You can realize all the split except for the seven, five, eight, eight, and which occurs for five with short signature. After a certain index, one try to see that he will start realizing all kind of partitions of a given index. When it is small and we have to construct some big numbers or some specific partitions then we do not found room to construct these diagrams. Rooms, I mean that we, like we have presented here, the connections we are drawing. So when the index is large and numbers are, partitions are less, it is easy to draw diagrams. So under the constraint of the demand Horowitz. So this finishes the first part of my talk. Next, I will discuss. If someone has any question, I would like to discuss. Devendra? Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to ask uh, you had. Okay, hello. Yeah, I just wanted to ask if you had this list of all non realizable partitions. Uh, how did you derive that? I mean, uh, can you give any show? It is not a list, it is a small list. Millington did not. Ah, that's it. okay. Small but list. for example, just pick one like three plus two plus one. Why it is not realizable? Is there any specific uh, concrete theorems or you just uh, settle it by case by case? Yeah, we are still settling case by case to observe any pattern why it is some reason. As I said, the 
my feeling is that there is no room but it is a vague idea i understand that so hmm. it seems like that ki we do not have a concrete reason why a partition is not realizable at least so far oh okay so the answer hello okay. um, answered only to you no no he answered you know ah are you listening yeah yeah i'm listening devendra ji are you listening yes yes yeah he could listen to me yeah but huh. he is not probably audible we are we cannot uh, hear you oh why is he unmuted hello no he is unmuted hello i am audible to audible siddharth no, i can hear him here yeah we can also hear. cannot hear so everyone else can hear i think Ah, uh, there is at least uh, you are muted from Hello. I am not sound muted. Is... Sound is also maximum. Oh. Somehow your voice is not audible in the Hello. First room. So that you can listen me now you can pass it. Yeah, me. yeah. I can listen but for the Kukarni and for the Katre. Hmm. We are not able to hear. So you uh, if they have something you can convey it to me. <coughs> Maybe wrong. I can listen, Professor Kathar and Professor Kulkarni. Also, ask them to speak Should only. Put out. Uh, okay. Siddharth. Hello, Siddharth. Ah, uh, speak. Hello. You are audible, Devendra. Ah, uh ha! -huh, I am audible, Professor Kulkarni. Yes. You can speak. I can hear you properly. I uh, yeah. So I think Siddhartha asked you a question: Why this three plus two plus one? Huh. This partition uh, does not arise. Huh. So you can say, in terms of permutations, the length of the per, uh, cycles that is the permutation method, and here is the picturesque method. Huh. Uh, how that uh, that is not possible. Yeah, so I said that yeah, my general feeling is that he, there is not enough room, kind of thing. But uh, we have to make it precise somehow. This is one of the concerns to give some reason, at least ad hoc reason, to why partitions are not realizable in geometric methods, right? Mm -hmm. Either geometric or permutation theoretic, both they are equivalent. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Ram. So, this is the second part, which is related to Professor Kulkarni's ninety-nine big paper on the arithmetic and geometric method in the state of modular group. Devendra, ah, uh, what about arithmetic uh, and one case in the earlier uh, corollary you wrote there? We have proved it somehow. Okay. Hmm. Uh, can you show again this corollary? Yeah yeah. Kind of yeah, yeah, yeah. This is this theorem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me finish it and we can discuss after the. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, mm. Yeah. So here, Professor Kulkarni describes his motivation was to construct the, or maybe address the old age-old problem of fundamental domains of the congruent subgroups of the modular group. And with a kind of condition that the side pairing transformation makes an independent set of generators. So the second part of this problem he was trying to address comes from a study of Rade Mathur, which we will just attend. So in his method, he basically geometrically uses the point care polygon theorem in hyperbolic geometry to consider construct the special polygons, which makes the required fundamental domain. Arithmetically, what he uses is the Faraday symbols based on the Faraday subdivision of. Uh, it will be clear in this meantime. Faraday subdivision of serving as in point of the boundary as of the fundamental domain. And another novel feature of this work is that there are many novel features. I cannot. It cannot be covered in single talk. This big paper. So he makes from the fundamental special polygons. Certain graphs and certain trees, 
and their kind of geometric invariant of those groups also, subgroups also. What Vardimachi studied is that to generating set of the congruent subgroup is independent or not. So how we define it a system of generator or a set of generator S of a subgroup H of a given group G is said to be independent. If H is the free product of the cyclic subgroups of the elements running over the S. Radimacher asked for a construction of an independent system of generators for congruent subgroups. One minute. And he constructed certain for the prime numbers, certain congruent subgroups, gamma naught p, and using the red master serial process. But this process, this construction does not involve the fundamental domains. So there was kind of two problems he was looking at and trying to attack both or maybe relating the ideas of both. One is to construct independent set of generators for the congruent subgroups and simply fundament, nice fundamental domain for the subgroup. So in that process, he came up with the construction of what is known as spatial polygon. So in general, a hyperbolic polygon made up of the hyperbolic geodesics, if it is a fundamental domain, then its side pairing transformation makes the generator of the given group of which it is fundamental domain. But those side pairing transformation do not form an independent set of generators. So a special polygon among the hyperbolic polygon is a convex polygon of finite hyperbolic area in hyperbolic space, which is made up of tiles of the extended modular tessellation. Unfortunately, I forgot to define what is this. It comes from the extended modular group uh, with extended modular group means the modular group plus non orientation preserving transformations also. Modular group is the index two subgroup of this extended modular group with of corresponding modular tessellation we are talking about. So, each side of the spatial polygon is the gamma translate of the complete hyperbolic geodesic joining zero to infinity. Uh, some pictures are missing at this point, and I'm sorry about it, but we will see in something soon. And else, it is a geodesic segment joining a fixed point of an elliptic element of order three to a cusp. So he proved this following theorem about a spatial polygon being the fundamental domain. So a special polygon is a fundamental domain for the subgroup generated by side pairing transformation and these transformation form an independent set of generators for subgroups. Conversely, every subgroup of finite index of group gamma, finite index in gamma admits a special polygon as a fundamental domain. The fairy symbols are come to use in this way. We first define what is that. And the fairest sequence is a finite sequence of rational in the interval 0, 1, which in their reduced form have denominator at most n and which is, which are again, let us see some examples so it will become more clear. We will come back to again. So these are the first five fairy sequences, which appeared first in a paper by John Ferry on the curious properties of the vulgar fractions. He has some theorem, but he did not have proof. I'm exactly forgetting what he was claiming about this very sequence. Is this modular relation or something else? So a special polygon has a vertex at infinity and its other vertices lie in the real line. For the, and on the rational numbers, which form a generalized fairy sequence. In the sense that for any two consecutive vertices, they satisfy this modular relation coming from the uh, and kind of giving hint to be related with the modular group. 
Moreover, the site pairing transformation of the spatial polygon imposes some extra conditions on the generalized Ferris sequence. And with this extra structure, uh, we call it uh, Ferris symbol or in the programming language Ferris codes. And so for a given Ferris symbols or Ferris code, there are exactly one and one correspondence between the spatial polygons. So this is the one main theorem I am considering from that paper, spatial polygons construction. And then I will relate this to the bipartite cubite graph. The bipartite cubite graph is a finite graph whose vertex set is divided into two disjoints at V0 and V1. Such that every vertex has a valency in V0 has valency one or two, and every vertex in the way V1 has a valency 1 or 3, there is a prescribed cyclic order on the edges incident at the each of the vertex of valency 3 and V1. And every jo edges join in a vertex in V0 with a vertex in V1. We will see pictures of it soon. So an isomorphism of bipartite cubite graph is, of course, an isomorphism of underlying graphs, preserving cyclic order. All notations are coming are standard in the graph theory. And another object consider, constructed is cubite tree diagram, or say finite tree. With this definition, the internal vertices of which are all the valence of three, and there is a prescribed cyclic order on the edges incident at each internal vertex. The terminal vertex are partitioned like into two possibly empty subset R and B, where the vertices on R are called bit. Vertices and in vertices in blue are called blue vertices. There is no involution on the set R. There is an involution on the set R. So here the result he proved for the P diagram and for um, bipartite cubite graph. So a P diagram is kind of a Invariant for a finite index subgroup. The event one finite one map from a spatial polygon to the spatial uh, isomorphism class of the P diagrams, and there is also a finite one map from the isomorphism class of P diagrams to the bipartite cubite graph. And this is these are the correspondence and which he has proved in his paper, and this, this is special theorem. Uh, here is a small typo, it should be CU instead of Q. And uh, I put it down because I have been working with the 2Q infinity Hecke triangle group. Singerman and Lang and Serputan has extended some of the work of Professor Kulkarni, but I recognize these two theorems and these two correspondence between the objects he constructed. They have not been able to consider so far, so I found it opportunity to extend it to have a triangle case. So here is the spatial polygon for the gamma 0, 6. So let me tell you how to get the distance from here. So a white vertex here in the second diagram is one where the two black or two tile white tiles meet. And the black tile is something where the if you recognize go bigger. So here are the, on the black vertices the three tiles are meeting, and on the white vertices only two tiles are meeting. So in this way. With this distinction, we will denote the vertices as black and white. So on the boundary side where the vertices uh, tiles are meeting, we will denote them by the red color. And after identification, 
like if you identify the edges like to construct a modular curve from this fundamental domain you can say it is a fundamental domain but it is a special polygon from this is a full kind of scatter so in the fundamental domain where they are meeting the on the boundary side the styles there are the red vertices there and after making them after identifying the edges we will again make them in the convert them into the black vertices or white vertices according to the previous consideration the way we have defined what would be the white vertices and what would be the black the top two red points are identifying given white vertices and two red so here in the picture so here the top red dots here taking rise to the two a white dot top and similarly the other identification will give rise to the this basic the form we will say what is it is it is we can consider just a bipartite cuboid graph for the given subgroup congruence of group of index of level 6 here is the fundamental domain for the gamma 0 Well, again, before moving directly going to the basis on this picture, you can try those identification and defining the vertices. Like two tiles meeting at certain vertex would be white, and three tiles meeting would be black. And tiles meeting on the boundary would be labeled as is red or blue. So these are the works. So this is the theorem I am trying to extend in the Hecke triangle with space. This particular correspondences and this particular theorem. Now since time is over, I will just pick up what is the further directions. So finite index subgroups have played a fundamental role in the study of the Bailey's theorem and Bailey's curve because of Bailey's theorem, which has in this talk I will state in the following way: a non-singular algebraic curve defined over a number field represents a compact Riemann surface. So there is a correspondence between the one and uh, compact Riemann surfaces and algebraic curves. and people ask which algebraic curve can be defined over a number field and this was a big question for the arithmetic geometers bailey came up with the solution that only those riemann surfaces can be defined uh, corresponding algebraic curve can be defined over number field which are the uniformized by the finite index of groups of the triangle group in particular modular group so here is the definition of the dessay the form let m be a compact oriented and Two manifold and be a parabolic graph on M such that M minus D is a disjoint union of simply connected open sets. Then D is called as the same the form. Note that it is quite a topological object. Do not require any geometric structure on the manifold. And Gosendik was interested in studying these objects and deriving the arithmetic consequences. So this makes the study of the finite index subgroups and these above method we discuss of Professor Kulkarni. Who of importance in these studies of arithmetic geometry? And here is the objects correspond to are in one one correspondence. So in the three subgroups of the triangle groups, Bailey map, or you can say particular specific holomorphic branch covering of projective line branch over three points. In the set of form with BHS and degree D function field and the transitive permutations of this type, these objects are in different study there by the different type of mathematicians with different expertise, but there are correspondences of having one result and having consequences in the other category. 
So this is the motivational quote with which I want to end. Was trying to study the numbers, curves over number scene. So that is my talk. And here are some references. Thank you. And thank you, Professor Kulkarni. <laughs> it is just my salutations to you. Why did you? Yeah. Okay. Why did you quote this? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So. Because I think no one has quoted Tankaracharya in this talk so far. It is some <laughs> philosophy <laughs> and Tankaracharya. Yes, that's right. Okay. Yes, thank you very much for the talk. Any questions or comments? I think there was something in chat, but I do not see that now. No, no, we do not consider edge coloring, Professor Ajit Tikbal Singh was asking. Huh, yeah. Only okay. the vertices are uh, the, just for the convenience sake. Because Actually, of, uh, um, yeah, Devendra, you are saying about R is greater than one case. Uh, this didn't uh, you mentioned here. Yeah, that theorem one. What about R is greater than one case, actually? I was interested in that. So in R equal to greater than one case, there are genus cases. Yes. And this is become a little difficult to realize okay. and draw the diagrams. Okay, okay. Hey, Devendra. Huh. So, Sagar and you were working on this problem, no? So, what happened? Uh, so, uh, I what happened? I suggested Sagar to extend this problem on the Hecke triangle groups. Okay. Because same things arise, like in the modular group, we have Z2 by J, uh, free product Z3. In the Hecke group, we have Z2 free project Zp, maybe some particular prime. Mm. And I think Sayuri should work. Actually, Professor Kulkarni's original work on the Kuros theorem paper is much more general for the Fuchsian groups. Modular group is just the standard case of it. Yeah, so maybe Sagar and you can uh, discuss with Professor Kulkarni yeah. and try to sort of, you know, get more results. So, so I think, yeah, I mean, so realizing the cusp splits is a good problem and difficult problem, geometric way. And there are studies of the Hecke group also, as I mentioned, Singerman and uh, Tan and Lang, they have studied a lot. Somehow I was able to recognize some theorem which was not proof for the Hecke groups, which I'm trying to prove. So these are the constraint of extending the thing because objects are studied very well before. Uh, Professor Kulkar, you want to make any comment? Or a comment? Yes. Siddhu, I have some uh, one question, very silly question. Yeah. So this cusp cutoff you are talk, talking about, mm. so is it equivalent to uh, something like I, if I just compactify at the cusp? Mm. Uh, the point I am raising it, uh, if you look at the topologically, there was no problem. But if you want, there is no problem. That is why. So we did it quite. Compactified by the cusp means you take each of the boundary component here and yeah. fill it to a point. Yeah. That's that's the usual compactification at the cusp that the number See. theorists and analysts talk about. But here for the homotopy, it's nice to have the boundary. actual boundary. Okay. So cusp is a homotopy equivalent to a boundary component. Somehow. You also want to thicken about that so that and I'm yeah. trying to understand why you leave and boundaries over the, there. These cusp widths, the semands are just the degrees of the one circle. Oh, okay. Right here, here you see this picture maybe. <coughs> yeah. Correctly. So <coughs> there's different degrees. Mm -hmm. Okay. I understand. How it goes to the circle below. Mm -hmm. I, I think the picture should have been better. I mean, this is the larger circle and this is the lower circle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we will say the inequivalent cusps in the covering. Okay, okay. Yeah. Now I got it. That, that is the picture behind yeah. this, and you can just so see keeping that. a cusp won't help because it's as good as just a mark point. But if you thicken it and just make it different sizes, then it will. Yeah. 
Okay. So and the first part of the study was purely topological study. Uh -huh. hmm. And it's reflected in the modular forms. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, uh, yeah, the extension of the modular forms at certain point and at cusp point uh, has been related to the cusp width of the particular cusp. Hmm. Okay, and I have one tiny comment. Uh, about this, uh, uh, Professor Ajit Iqbal Singh's comment about the coloring. age coloring. Yeah. So I think we, we, here you are looking at uh, a free group of two finite groups. So this PSL2 Z is Z2 star Z3 and there is no proper amalgam over here. Okay, so for example, if you just take something like SL2 Z, mm -hmm. Z4 star Z6 amalgamated at Z3. So if you look at that picture, there you need some kind of coloring, which is colored by some subgroup. Can you again repeat what you're talking? Is so like, even in the same picture, if you, instead of looking at PSL2, if you look at SL2 hmm. without projectivizing, hmm. then you'll have some non-trivial group, which is kind of tagged around those edges, which is kind of one of the example of trivial coloring there. So this was generalized to Basset theory in general. The, hmm. Covering spaces, uh, the covering groups basically are kind of uh, grow up with those both vertices and edges being uh, by certain subgroups. Here, the vertices, our the geometric concern is they are the branch points. Yeah, but this is a very different question. Uh, different comment, maybe. Uh, so if you if you make it more complicated, then mm -hmm. you will see you will probably need to color those edges up also. In this theory, I have not seen anything people coloring the edges basically. Mm -hmm. Constructing depth since I think Professor Kulkarni's this method of ferret symbol, one of the finest methods. No, what what was the Ajit Igbal Singh's comment? Do you consider the edges coloring too? No, I think. Edge coloring? No, we did not consider. Hmm. Oh, okay, okay. There is a lot of literature on edge coloring for yeah, one so, thing. So that uh, is the part of the graph the, theory. Uh, we are just yes. uh, taking borrow some uh, notations and concepts from the graph theory. Uh, yes. A second thing is that uh, bipartite graphs with the degree one, you know, they give rise to permutations or uh, edge coloring, you know, they uh, resonating valence bond states. Okay. They give, uh, okay. And then you can study them through polynomials and several variables of degree at most one. Okay. Okay. And then, you know, that, that is what I will present as a part of my talk uh, at Aisar Ali that Krishnendu was telling about. I see, I see. No, really, it would be nice to see and understand how the graphs are made. <laughs> and another thing is that ethical ring, Professor Partha Sarathi has used to produce symplectic dilations of symplectic matrices in his paper on stochastic dilation. I see. That's a different subject, Professor Ajit was saying. Yes, but uh, uh, graph theory is so popular now, you know, oh. so, and, so we that must know more you know. interconnections. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank, thank you. you so, uh, any other questions are there? Uh, any, any comments? Yeah. So, otherwise, let us thank the speaker again. Uh, thank, thank you again you. for giving me chance to present this. Yeah. Thing. I have a suggestion. Yeah. Oh, so whatever you presented, write them, write them down nicely. Yeah, I will send you the so many pictures actually we have done. Yeah, but you have to explain the pictures, no? Yeah, yeah. So we will explain one picture, and you have to understand the rest of them. <laughs> <General> <laughs>